So today's class, I want to cover two topics. Uh, one topic is about circuits involving batteries and resistors. And a second topic is about circuits that involve batteries, resistors, and, and, and capacitors. So for the first topic, where well, we've got circuits involving batteries and resistors, it turns out that some circuits can't be solved by equivalent resistances and Ohm's law alone. And we're going to talk about those circuits that can't be solved by techniques of equivalent resistances in Ohm's law. We're going to introduce what's called Kirchhoff's laws. And there's a Kirchhoff's current law and there's a Kirchhoff's voltage law and we're going to explore the use of Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws. So that's the first topic. Second topic, as I say, is to explore circuits that contain all these components that we've met over the past few weeks. That's batteries, resistors, and capacitors. We're going to look specifically at the case of circuits that would charge up a capacitor or would discharge a capacitor, i.e. put charge on the place of a capacitor or remove the charge from the place of a capacitor. We'll see how those circuits work. We'll explore exactly precisely how the charge builds up on a capacitor, exactly precisely how the charge discharges from a capacitor. Okay. Kirchhoff circuit rules. So, this circuit here is an example of a circuit that you can't solve using the concept of equivalent resistance and Ohm's law alone. So it's not possible to solve this circuit by the techniques we met last week. The problem is, for this circuit, that you can't start poking around in this circuit to trying to find either resistors that are simply in series or resistors that are simply in parallel. That doesn't work for this circuit. For example, you might say, well look, here's a couple of resistors in parallel, why don't I combine them? But the problem is that there's a battery here. So this isn't simply a parallel arrangement of two resistors. Likewise up here, you couldn't say, oh, I've got two resistors here, they're in parallel, I'll just put them together as one. You can't do it. You can't do it because there's batteries also in this parallel piece of the circuit. And so this is, you know, it's not an overly complicated circuit in terms of the number of parts. It's got two batteries and three resistors. But this is a circuit we can't solve using our prior techniques of equivalent resistance Ohm's law. This is a circuit you would solve with Kirchhoff's rules. This is a circuit you, you solve with Kirchhoff's current and voltage rules. Okay, so, so let's explore this circuit a bit and let's introduce these two rules. So as I mentioned, there's a current rule and a voltage rule. The voltage rule, you'll sometimes see it, may say it in the textbook, sometimes called a loop rule. And the um, current rule is sometimes called a, a junction rule. That's because the, the voltage rule gets applied to a loop in the circuit, and the um, current rule gets applied to a junction where wires meet in a circuit. But anyway, I'm going to call it current rule and voltage rule. Um, the current rule. So the current rule says that the sum of currents entering a junction equals the sum of the currents leaving a junction. So think about this point here. This is a junction. This big emerald green spot is a junction because this is where you know, the, the wire going on the top part of the circuit, the wire going around the bottom part of the circuit, and the wire along the middle part of the circuit, they're all meeting here. So this is a junction. And um, the current rule says simply that the, um, the sum of the currents entering the junction must be equal to sum of currents leaving the junction. I mean, that's just saying, right, you can't, you can't lose current. 
uh, or you can't suddenly gain current. Whatever current goes in must come out. Like whatever water went in must come out. So, in this particular case, as an example, as an illustration, if you look at our free, I've labeled three currents. I1, I2, I3, and I've labeled three directions for the three currents. Those are the three directions that um, positive charges would flow. That's the um, definition of the current direction. Uh, and so I1's going to the left, I2's going to, no, that's the right. I1's going to the right, I2's going to the right, I3's going to the left. But at the junction over here, think of it this way. I1 is going into the junction. I2 is going into the junction. I3 is coming out of the junction. Whatever's going in, I1 plus I2 equals whatever's coming out, that's I3. So that's the current rule. So it's, it's not a very complicated rule. It's a simple idea, and it's a, um, a simple statement. Voltage rule. OK, the voltage rule says the sum of all the potential differences around a complete loop in the circuit, if you sum all those potential differences up, you must get zero if you completely walked around a loop in the circuit. So as you walk around a loop in a circuit to end back at where you started, you'll typically meet batteries, you'll typically meet resistors, and so when you walk across the battery, you'll be stepping up, stepping down in potential as you walk across the terminals of the battery. When you walk through a resistor, you're also stepping up or stepping down in potential because the two ends of the resistor are at different potentials because there's a current passing through the resistor. So if you add up all those changes, the voltage rule says that when you get back to where they, you started, they add up to zero. Uh, so if you want an example, think of... Um, this, there's several loops in this circuit. There's a big one that goes around the outside. Then there's um, the upstairs one. This is the upstairs of the house here. This is a loop around the circuit. And there will be another one downstairs here. So I'm just picking one of them. Uh, this one up here. And I'm going to imagine that I um, walk ar ar around this circuit. And um, we're going to add up all the... Uh, differences around the circuit. Actually, which one did I pick? I walked, uh, actually I walked around, uh, I realize now, I've walked around this, this bottom piece. I put the arrow up here. I've actually walked around the bottom piece. I better change that in the, in the slide. So, supposing I, I, I walk along this ground floor here, then upstairs, and then back through the middle floor here, and then around to where I started. Let's just trace out what happens. I um, walk through the battery here, the 4-volt battery. And I'm going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, so I climb 4 volts. I walk through the resistor. So I'm going to change my voltage as I walk through the resistor. How much does it change? Ohm's law tells us how much it changes. The voltage changes by IR. So the voltage change here is IR. It's I2, that's the current, times the resistance, that's 2, 2 ohms. So I'll get a voltage change of 2I2. And because I'm walking in, I'm going to mention this later, because I'm walking in the direction of the current, this is actually walking downhill. And so... Um, this minus 2I2 here is the change in the voltage across this resistor. And then I continue walking around the circuit, and the last element I've got to walk through is the, um, the 3 ohm resistor. So I'm going to walk through the 3 ohm resistor, and again, there's going to be a change in potential when I walk through the 3 ohm resistor. It's going to be given by Ohm's law. It's going to be given by IR. It's the product of I3 times the 3 ohms of resistance. So it's going to be 3I3. And again, because I'm walking in the direction of current flow, that is a downward change in potential. And so when I walked around this lower portion of the circuit, 
I've got three changes in potential from the three elements in the circuit. I've got one for the battery, that's the four, plus four. And I've got two for the two resistors, that's the minus two I2, the minus three I3. And so that's an application of the, um, the voltage rule. And so you can see there that I'm, if I was trying to solve this circuit, with um, Kirchhoff's rules, you can build equations, you can construct equations from the current rule, from the voltage rule, that are relationships, connections between the currents that are flowing in the arms of the circuit. And you could imagine, you could imagine that if you build enough equations, you can solve the currents that are flowing in the circuit. And that's typically how you proceed with Kirchhoff's rules. You're building equations, relations between currents, then you're able to mathematically solve those relations, equations between those currents. And we've just seen um, an example, one example of the current rule at one junction, one example of the voltage rule at, uh, for one loop. And you could imagine that there's other junctions in general in circuits, other loops in circuits. You could be, make more and more equations. I want to make a couple of points because I, I went through it kind of quickly on that last slide as I introduced voltage rule. Uh, and they have to do with um, when you walk through a battery, do you walk up or down in potential? When you walk through a resistor, do you step up or down in potential? So here's the case of the battery. So it, in, in this particular slide here, upstairs, I'm walking from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So this is the direction of my walk by this red arrow. And then downstairs here, for this battery, I'm walking from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So this is the direction of my walk downstairs here, this blue arrow. When you walk from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, then the change in potential, the change in voltage, the potential difference that you accrue as you add up the contributions to Kirchhoff's voltage rule is going to be a positive change in potential. So, you know, it's, maybe it's obvious. You're going from the negative to positive terminal. That's a growth increase in potential. So that, that would be a, if you're walking that way through the battery, uh, that's a positive change in potential. Uh, downstairs here, if you're walking from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, you're stepping down in potential. So if you walk this way through a battery when you're applying Kirchhoff's voltage rule and trying to, uh, you know, assemble all the changes in potential, this would be a negative change in potential. You've gone from the, you've stepped down in potential from the higher potential of the positive terminal to the lower potential of the negative terminal. So it's very, you know, I know from personal experience that applying Kirchhoff's rules, it's very easy to, to get the answer wrong. And the reason it's very easy to get the answer wrong is it's very easy to make sign mistakes. And this is one place that you can make a sign mistake by um, not, a, not that you're going to get three volts wrong or one and a half volts wrong or nine volts wrong for a battery, but it's, it's easy to... Um, forget to get the sign right, the positive sign or the negative sign, whether you went up or down in potential. It's even worse, it's even more likely, I think, or at least in my case, it's more likely for the resistors, right? When you walk across a resistor, uh, there's a change in potential. And uh, here's a picture of me in this red arrow walking across this resistor where I'm going in the direction of the current flow. Uh, and then also down here, when I walk across this resistor, there's a, um, there's a change in potential by Elm's law. And here I'm walking opposite the direction of current flow. So we've got to get these, these signs right when we walk across resistors for the change in potential that's given by Ohm's law. We'll get the sizes right. It's just I times R. That's the size of the potential change. The important thing to remember is that the current, that current is, is flowing downhill. When we imagine the current going around the circuit, it's like we're imagining water 
flowing around a circuit. The current, the water, is flowing downhill. And so if you walk in the direction of the current, that's what I'm doing upstairs here, then this will be a decrease in potential. So when you're adding up, accruing all the contributions in a voltage law, that would be a negative change in potential. When you're walking opposite the direction of the current through a resistor, that's an increase in potential because you're walking up the hill. Imagine the resistor as, say, a waterfall. You're walking up the waterfall in opposite to the direction of the current of the water flow. And so that would be a positive change in potential. So again, these signs are important to get right. Let's get some practice and work through an example problem of applying Kirchhoff's current voltage rules to a, to a circuit that couldn't be solved otherwise with you know, equivalent resistance, Ohm's law alone. So we're going to work through an example here. I'm going to work through this um, on the overheads because it would, you know, we'd be here, you'd miss spring break if I try and draw, you know, draw out all these circuits on the, um, uh, for some reason I can't remember the name of this device anymore. Um, whatever. Um, anyway, so here's our circuit. And what we're going to do is explore, like we're explorers, we explore this circuit with um, Kirchhoff's rules, and we're going to solve for the unknowns in this circuit. The unknowns are the currents in this circuit. We know we've got these two batteries, and we know they're 20 volts and 10 volts. We know we've got these three resistors. They're 35 and 20 ohms. What we don't know in the three arms of the circuit is what the, what the currents are. What's the current in the top arm, the middle arm, and the bottom arm? And so that's our job. And um, as you can see, this is not a problem you can solve with equivalent resistance. You can't pair off resistors in this circuit to make an equivalent resistance because there's no piece of the circuit that contains just two resistors in parallel. They've always got a battery that's accompanying them. Okay, so here's our circuit. I redrew it. it I must have made this slide when pixels were somehow really expensive because I'm not using many pixels to represent the resistors. Um, and I, I don't remember the story of that. Okay. So here's an interesting point about um, solving these problems with Kirchhoff's rules. You know, I, I gave that whole spiel um, about you've got to get the signs right when you walk across the resistors. Um, but, to, you know, you might say, well, to get the signs right, you've got to know the directions of the currents. You, what you actually do is you guess the directions of the currents. So I'm going to just simply guess the directions of the currents. And, you know, there's three of them. I'm probably going to get some wrong. So when you guess the directions of the currents, what you've then got to be consistent with, when you construct your voltage rule for the potential differences, you've got to be consistent with your guesses for the directions of the currents. So when we're being careful about the changes that going ups and downs in potential, we're being careful about being consistent with our guesses of the directions of the currents. At the very end of the problem, when you've solved the three currents, you know, you're going to get three values for the currents, one amp, two amp, three amp. They could, they're going to have signs. They might be plus one amp, plus two amp, plus three amp. That means you guessed every current the right direction. If you get a minus sign, it just means that you guessed the current's direction in the wrong direction, the opposite direction. Uh, the, the value for the current is completely right. It's just it's heading in the reverse direction from your original guess. So right at the end of the problem, you can correct your guesses in terms of the directions of the currents. And it doesn't matter how wrong or how you, right you are about the initial guesses. So um, when I solved this problem, I just made this random guess that at this node here, say, or for these three arms here, that the current I1 is going to be flowing from uh, the left to the right across the top arm. The current I2 is going to be flowing uh, from across the middle arm, is 
also flowing, flowing from the left to the right. And the current I3, that's across the bottom arm, uh, that's flowing in the opposite direction from the right to the left. And so that, that's just pure guess. I didn't think about it at all. I just guessed. But, I mean, plus and minus signs must have been cheap because for some reason I've labeled these things with pairs of plus and minus signs. But anyway, um, I've now got to be consistent. When, when, I, when I apply voltage rules, I've got to be consistent with these guesses for um, the changes of potential across a resistor. And so if I think about how I'm going to be consistent with these guesses, if this current I1 is flowing from left to right, it means that this is the more positive end of the uh, resistor. This is the more negative potential end of the resistor. So walking left to right is going downhill. Same way for the resistor in the center here. If this current is going left to right, then this is the more positive potential end of the resistor. This is the more negative potential end of the resistor. And if I was walking left to right, I'd be going downhill. It'd be a negative potential change. Uh, it's the opposite for the resistor on the bottom arm. Here, the current is flowing from right to left, the opposite direction. So here, the right-hand side of the resistor is the more positive potential. The left-hand side is the more negative potential. And so if I was walking right to left, I'd be going downhill. And so I can just guess what I like over here on the left-hand side. But once I've guessed what I like, I've got to be consistent here with my resistors. Okay, so now let's, um, now let's um, build some equations based on Kirchhoff's rules and um, my guesses for the current flows and my observations about the um, change in potentials across the resistance. So this slide... This slide is me applying Kirchhoff's current rule and voltage rules to make three equations because I'm thinking at this point, right, I got three unknowns. I1, I2, I3, three currents through the top, middle, and bottom arms. I'm going to need three equations to solve three unknowns. And so I'm going to try and build three equations. Um, in a circuit like this, Typically, we can build one equation using the current rule. Remember, that's the one that's applied at a junction. And then we're going to build the remaining equations out of voltage rules. Out of voltage rules applied to different loops in the circuit. And so I'm going to pick a couple of loops in the circuit to apply the voltage rule to. So let's, let's get going on that. Uh, I always start with, like, you know, if, if you exercise, not that I would, but um, if you do exercise, you want to warm up. So I like to warm up for Kirchhoff's rules on the current rule because that's typically, you know, easy. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's current rule to this uh, junction here in, in emer emerald green. The um, current flowing out of that junction is I1 and I2. So I1 plus I2 is coming out. I3 is going in. And Kirchhoff's current rule says that the sum of the currents going in, I3, is equal to the currents coming out. And so this is the simple application of Kirchhoff's current rule. Um, you could say, well, let's, that, that's easy. Let's build another equation like that on the other side. There's another junction, right? That way we don't have to deal with all this silly sign stuff and whatever with um, voltage rule. But if you try to build another equation over here, you just get the same equation. It doesn't, doesn't give you anything new. So there's only one, in this circuit, there's only one piece of information, one relationship that you get from current rule. Now we're going to build two equations, because we need two more, from the, from the voltage rules. And um, my code in here, this, this light blue, is me applying the the voltage rule to this lower loop it, downstairs in the circuit and whatever this color is called, I don't know, um, this orangey color, this is um, me applying the, um, uh, the current rule to uh, the in 
the outside of the circuit, all the way around the outside of the circuit. Okay. So let's take the light blue loop. And I'm going to start here at the top left of that loop, and I'm going to walk towards the right, down, towards the left, and back up. So the first component I hit is the battery. Its voltage, we called it, I called it here, it's EMF, epsilon 2. And I'm walking up the potential hill from negative to positive terminal. So that's epsilon 2, plus epsilon 2. Then I, then I walk into the resistor. Right. Now I'm jumping down the waterfall. So I'm going down, down the potential hill here. And the, um, the size of the change in potential is given by Ohm's law. So it would be I2, R2. You see I2, R2 here. And I'm going down the water hill, so it's a minus sign. And then I carry on walking around the circuit. Not much interesting over here, but I get to another waterfall. Uh, this waterfall um, is resistor number three. Uh, the current through it is I3. So the change in potential here is I3, R3. You see I3, R3 here. And uh, this is also going, I'm also going in the direction of the current, so I'm also going down the water, waterfall. And so this is a, um, a, a decrease in electrical potential. And all these three changes then add up to make zero. And that's the voltage rule. So that's an application of the voltage rule, and it's careful about the signs. Um, this loop here, right around the outside, exactly the same idea. If I start at this point again, I'm going to walk upstairs, then through this battery. This is now battery epsilon 1, but I'm again walking from the negative to the positive terminal, so I've got a plus epsilon 1. I now walk through a resistor. This is now resistor R1, not resistor R2, but again I'm walking in the direction of the current flow, so the change in potential is I1, R1, and it's a downwards, a decrease in potential, so a minus sign here. And then I walk around the circuit. Not much happens down here. Da, 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 da. And I get to this resistor finally over here. This is the one I met before. I'm going the same way through it. So this is minus I3, R3, just like this was minus I3, R3. And these three changes must add up to zero. And so that is three equations that relate the three currents and from which we could solve those three currents. I've turned this physics problem now into just a math problem, really. And this slide looks horrific, but um, let, let me just say a few words about it. it um, so let me say something about um, how I solve, once I've built those three equations, how I then go about solving for the three unknown values, I1, I2, I3. One thing I would always tell you from lecture one through to lecture 24, right, is that use symbols in equations when you're solving a problem. Because it's easy to keep, easier to keep track of symbols. Symbols tell you what they what the quantity is. If you plug in the numbers straight away, you've just got a, you know, you've got this um, bunch of numbers, and it's very hard to trace mistakes or errors or things like that. This is going to be an exception. I'm going to plug in the numbers straight away. Um, I'm going to plug in the numbers um, because in this particular case, it, it just feels, it just seems way easier to boil down these three equations with all the R's and whatever's and, and battery epsilons and whatever's to just three equations with I1, I2, I3 and three numbers and, and numbers. And so that's the big picture of this slide is that here were the three equations that we derived from physics concepts on the last slide. So these three equations here. Downstairs here are the three equations again, but I, I've done two things. 
I plugged in the values of the resistances and I plugged in the values of the EMF. So, you know, there's four numbers that I plugged in. There was the 10 and 20 volts for the EMFs um, and there was the, the 5 and 20 ohms, I, uh, five, uh, three resistors, aren't they? 5, 20 and 30 ohms for the resistances. So there was, there was five numbers there. I plugged them all in. When I plugged them all in, I got these three equations here. To make these three equations look a little simpler, I just um, you know, divided through by common factors. So, for example, I divided through this one by, by 5. It gets this equation here. And I divided this one through by, um, by, by 10. I got, got this equation here. And I rearranged them a little bit to just get three equations that on the right-hand side have I3, I2, I1. And so that was just the bit of algebra that somehow, I'm describing what works for me, right? Um, I mean, I've talked to other people, but it works for them too. Uh, I'm describing what works for me, which is to boil down this jumble into, into this mathematics. And our problem is really just to solve these three, these three currents, I1, I2, I3, from these, these three equations. And so, so that's, that's our goal. It's gone very quiet. <laughs> Which, you know, if you're standing up here, that starts to feel really bad. Uh, I, anyway, um, so how would I go about doing that? I'm not going to go through all the details of that because um, le let me say something else. That on an exam, I would not give you a Kirchhoff's rule problem where I was asking you to solve for the three currents because it could send you off into a space of trying to rearrange three equations for the, you know, the, the five hours of the exam. I could ask you to write down a Kirchhoff's rule equation for a loop in a circuit. I could do that. Or uh, I could ask you to write down a current rule for a circuit. I could ask those sort of questions. But solve an entire problem. To solve three unknowns for three equations would be too much. But let me show you how it works. These are the three equations from, from the... Uh, uh, I'm showing you how, how it works because there is a homework problem related to this. These are the three equations from the last slide. Yeah. Equations 1, 2, and 3, I labeled them. And we've got three unknown quantities, I1, I2, I3. How would we go about solving these? This is how I, I solve them. Think about it this way. If I took equation number 2 and used it to replace I2 in equation number 1 with this combination of I3, and I took equation number 1 and used it to replace I1 in equation number 1 with this combination of I3, what would I get? I get, if I did that, I get one equation, the top equation, that only has one unknown in it. I've gotten rid of the I1 and replaced it by some combination of I3. I got rid of the I2. I replaced it by some combination I3. I've made one equation with one unknown, one equation with one unknown, and just rearrange it and solve for I3. And so that's what I did when I went ahead and solved this problem, because I did do it. I, I plugged equation number two into equation number one, equation number three into equation number one, and solved for I3. I got 0.47 amps. Then it becomes super easy to solve the remaining currents. It's super easy to solve the remaining currents because if you look at the second equation, if you know I3, just stuff it in here. Put 0.47 in here and you get I2. If you, and for I1, if you know I3, just stuff it in here in the third equation and you'll figure out what I1 is. And so once I got I3, I just used equation 2 alone or equation 3 alone to solve for the two other currents. I got, I got 0.12 amps and 0.35 amps for those two currents. And so that's how you would, how you would do it. If you were doing this, if you do this on the homework, for example, here's an important thing to do. Because it's, 
you know, as I say, you've got to be careful about the numbers. You've got to be especially careful about the signs. It's really easy to make a numerical mistake in these types of problems. You can check your answer at the end in a rather simple way, right? You can check that if you plug, this was the equation from the current rule, if you, if you plug your currents in, the values of I1, I2, I3, that the left-hand side does equal the right-hand side. So that's what I'm checking here. Look, I1 plus I2, the two currents that are coming out, 0 0.12, 0 0.35, do add up to the current that's flowing in. And so my solution obeys the current rule. Likewise, you can check that your solutions obey the voltage rule. I did it for the, um, the smaller loop at the bottom here. That was the equation based on that, and I plugged the currents here. No, I won't go through the numbers. I did it for the entire loop here. And um, I, I used this equation here, plugged in the currents, and checked that this equation is correct in terms of the left-hand side and right-hand side. So that's a good technique for, for checking your solution is right, that the numbers do obey the current rule. Yeah? Can you say that one more time, sorry? Um, so I wouldn't be using the act in parallel or act in series quite in that context for this. So the currents, so the the current is associated with this arm, and this arm, and this arm. So the, there's currents in these three arms. And um, y you know, these, we, we use parallel and series a lot when we talked about capacitors and resistors being in parallel and series. Um, I'm, not, I'm just not sure I would use that language for these, these currents of being, you know, a series current versus a parallel current. Uh, this current is flowing across this top arm. Uh, this current is flowing across this middle arm. And this current here is flowing across this bottom arm. They are flowing, two of them to the right, one of them to the left. Uh, that's kind of the language that I would use to de describe those currents. Does that make sense? Current, current two is going straight horizontally across through resistor R2. Current one is going straight up and goes through R1. And current uh, three is along the bottom arm and goes through uh, R3. My, my naming of current one, two, and three was because current one just goes through resistor one. Current two just goes through resistor two. Current three goes through resistor three. Does that make sense? That's kind of how I define the currents. Oh, you see, yeah. So I don't think you want to think about it this way. You know, where does I1 only has a meaning of a current in this? It's just a statement that the current in this arm here is 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 I1. And I3 is just a statement the current in this arm here is I3. Um, where does this current go? Well, the electrons in this current either go upstairs or they go you know, across the middle. And, and that's true of any one of those currents. When it goes into or out of the junction, when it goes into the junction, its, current, its electrons could go in either arm. Uh, when it comes out of the junctions, its electrons could have come from either of the other arms. Um, it's just that what we know is the total currents flowing through each of the three arms. So that's a, it's a very good point, you know, conceptually. Um, I'm not trying to s assign where current I1 goes after it's gone into the junction or why, where I3 came from as it came out of the junction. I'm just saying that I1, I2, I3 are in the three arms. Okay, here's a uh, quiz. <laughs>
So, so in this quiz, we're asked to consider a particular uh, junction in the circuit. It's here. It's right at this point here. And we're asked to think about the current rule. And we're asked to think about the currents flowing in and out of this junction. And which one of these um, equations here correctly describes the, the current rule for this particular junction. So I'll give you a, a, another minute or two to think about that, and then we'll, um, we'll move on. Okay, so in this circuit, we're thinking about that junction, the junction we called B. And we're thinking about these three currents that are called I2, I1, and for some reason, well, here, I24. So the current rule would say that whatever currents are flowing in is equal to whatever currents are the sum of the currents that are flowing out. So in this case, the, there's one current flowing into that junction. It's I2. So I2 is flowing in, and then there's two currents flowing out, I1 and I24. So I could write the current rule as I2 that goes in equals I1 plus I24 that's coming out. Now, if you look at the solutions, that, that, exact, that equation, that I2 equals I1 plus I24, isn't explicitly there. But there is a version of it that's there. So if think about, think, imagine in your head. I, I am. I2 equals I1 plus I24. If I move the I2 from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, I get zero equals minus I2 plus I1 plus I24, which is, which is one of these equations here. I, I can't even see the screen, and I'm like within two feet of it, um, but it's, it's uh, where is it? Yeah, this one here. This is an I, this one here, yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Let's talk about circuits with batteries, resistors, and capacitors. I want to just mention, first of all, um, in, in discussing circuits with batteries and resistors and capacitors, where we're charging and discharging ca uh, capacitors, um, we're going to meet a new mathematical function that we haven't been using up to now in this class, and that's the exponential function. And so we're going to be using this exponential function. Um, Here's a X, what we would call an exponential decay. And it's described by this exponential function with it, its exponent, what we call the exponent, being a negative value. So e to the minus x is a decay exponential. It contains a negative exponent, and it corresponds to for example, a population of something that is decreasing with time, decreasing with time in an exponential way. Um, you know, a classic example of this is if I brought into the class for fun, I bring in a radioactive material. And um, that material is decaying um, with radioactivity, and it's decaying in exactly this way. It decays, its decay is described by an exponential, 
And what that exponential is describing is that the, um, the number of decays at any moment in time is in proportion to the population of the radioactive atoms, the number of the radioactive atoms. So that's what an exponential decay law describes. Uh, over here on the right, um, this is uh, exponential growth. So this is where uh, exponential growth is where you've got an ex is described mathematically by an exponential function again. That's the E here. But the exponent of the function is now a positive number. So this is something that grows exponentially. And so a, an example of this was supposing instead of bringing a ra radioactive source into the classroom for fun, I bring COVID in, right? But <laughs> That's a, um, that's a virus, and that in the population can grow exponentially. So that's a famous example of um, how, how viruses grow is exponential growth. Uh, again, that's where the, um, the, the increase in the population is in proportion to the population itself. That's what the exponential growth function describes. So we're going to meet both of these two functions when we... Um, when we charge and discharge. We're going to meet the exponential functions when we charge and discharge a capacitor. OK. So let's look at an example of charging up a capacitor. So the way I would charge a capacitor is with this electrical circuit here. So let me describe it. Um, we've got a capacitor, obviously. It's over here. It's a parallel plate capacitor. And uh, we've got a um, battery over here to charge it, positive and negative terminals. We've, we're going to charge it through a resistor. That's this guy here, the resistor. And um, I've also got a switch. I've got a switch in the circuit. So when the switch is open, you know, it's an arrangement of these three components, the battery, the resistor, the capacitor. But because I haven't completed the circuit, that's not gonna, nothing's going to happen with the battery, the resistor, and the capacitor. When I close the switch, that's when I start charging up the uh, capacitor from the, uh, from the battery through the resistor. So the moment I close this switch, which I call T equals zero, like I'm launching a rocket or something, um, I'm going to start charging up this capacitor. Now, here's an interesting question. Before we start charging the capacitor, we know the charge on the plates of the capacitor. And actually, after closing the switch, if we waited a long time, it would be easy for us to calculate the charge on the plates of the capacitor. So before we started charging, we know the charge on the plates of the capacitor is zero. So to begin with, we've got zero charge on the place of the capacitor. And then if I've shut the switch and I you know, come back the next day, for sure I know that the next day with the switch closed, the charge on the place of the capacitor, that's the Q here, will simply be the, um, by that equation that describes capacitance, the voltage I've applied times the capacitance of the capacitor. So that's the final charge on the place of the capacitor. So without knowing really anything about the details of how the thing's going to charge up, we know where it starts with no charge. We know where it ends up when it's fully charged. The only question here is how does it get from the beginning to the end? And it gets to the beginning from the beginning to the end through these exponential laws, these exponential functions that I, I just introduced. So that's what we're going to discuss, really. So... I want to introduce this equation. This is the charge on the plates of the capacitor as a function of time. And I'm going to then, in another slide or two, introduce a second equation, which will be the current on the, in the circuit as a function of time. So let, let's look at this equation here. So firstly, Q parentheses T. What do I mean by that? I mean that Q... The charge on the place of the capacitor is a function of time. So this is this, an equation on the right-hand side that's going to describe the time dependence of the charge on the capacitor's plates. This equation on the right-hand side says a couple of interesting things. Let's think about it at 
think about this equation at time zero. If you plug in zero into this exponent here for the time, the x, this function is e to the zero, which is just one. And so this equation says that at time zero, you've got no charge on the place of the capacitor, which is exactly what we discussed on the previous slide. We're starting with no charge on the place of the capacitor. Supposing you wait a long time. If you wait a long time, so we plug in a really large value for the time, say infinitely large. This is a negative, very large number in the exponent. e to the power of a negative, very large number is actually 0. So this equation just becomes q at large times, which is q is the amount of charge when the capacitor is fully charged. So first of all, I'm saying that this, this equation that involves time actually does include the fact that there's no charge to start with, and then after a certain amount of charge, time, the capacitor becomes fully charged with charge Q. So it has all, in, all of that in there. But the extra piece that it adds is how the charge grows from zero to Q. That's described by this time dependence. And actually, I'll show you a plot of it. It grows with a time scale a duration that is governed by RC, the product of the resistance and the capacitance in the circuit. So an important thing about this equation is this RC here. That RC is determining the time scale for the accumulation, the charging up of the capacitor. If RC is a big number, it takes the capacitor a long time to charge. If RC is a small number, the capacitor charges relatively quickly. So that's the role of RC. So if you make your, you know, you're building this, you go home tonight, you think, I want to build one of those. I'm going to build an RC circuit, charge it up. Um, if you make your RC product small, then it's going to charge up really quickly. If you make your RC product big, it's going to take a while to charge up. It determines the time scale. Here's a picture. Maybe this is helpful. Maybe not. <laughs> um, this is a picture, a graph. Uh, this graph has time as the horizontal axis. The charge on the plates of the capacitor is the vertical axis. The line here, the curve here, starts at a charge of zero, you know, before we shut the switch in the circuit. The line here ends up at a charge, which is the charged on the fully charged capacitor, so this value here. And this line represents this equation, which is how we get from no charge on the place of the capacitor downstairs in the, in the bottom left corner to fully charged in the top right corner. So this line represents this equation. And uh, this line is steeper or shallower depending on the value of the time constant, depending on this RC. So that's the charging of the capacitor as a function of time in this particular RC circuit. Uh, I'll show you this one other equation. This is the current that's flowing in the circuit. So again, if you look at this equation here, this I, open parentheses, T, close parentheses, that, that's current as a function of time. It's how the current is changing with time. And so this is the current that's flowing as we're charging up this capacitor. And this is the equation for that, um, that current. And what you see here is actually the moment you, this is interesting, the moment you shut the switch, you get the biggest current. It's simply this uppercase I here that is determined by the resistor in the circuit and the battery in the circuit by Ohm's law. And then, as just, so the moment you close the switch, you've got the biggest current, and then that current just starts to fade away exponentially with time. And it fades away exponentially with time with the same time constant, RC, as the charge on the plates of the capacitor is growing with time. And that makes sense that the current dies off at the same rate that the charge builds up because the charge is building up because the current is flowing. And so here you're seeing, in these equations, right, I think of them as little, um, uh, 
little windows into the details of how the charge is accumulating on the capacitor, how that current is flowing to accumulate the charge on the plates of the capacitor. And it's all embodied by this sort of exponential function that is so, comes up so many times in physics, in science, in biology, and chemistry uh, when you get things that change with time. That's when you see exponential functions. Here's a picture of the current, of that equation, which is the current versus time. So if we look at this picture, I mean graph, uh, horizontally is time again, so increasing time. And then vertically is now not the charge on the place of the capacitor, but the current flowing in the circuit in which the capacitor is connected. Um, this is the moment, time zero, where I close the switch. And I said, that's the moment in this circuit where you get the biggest current. It's really just determined by Ohm's law and the voltage of the battery and the resistance of the resistor determine the uh, current in the circuit by Ohm's law. But as the capacitor starts to accumulate charge exponentially, the current that's flowing to the capacitor starts to fall off. And when the capacitor becomes fully charged, over here on the right of this graph, then the current in the circuit has extinguished itself. It's now zero. And so here we're seeing the current that's flowing onto the capacitor. And the previous graph, we saw the charge that's, a, that's accumulating on the capacitor. And we saw the two equations, these two equations involving the exponential functions, involving these time constants, RC, that describe the charge accumulation and the current flow. OK, I want to look at the same thing now for um, not charging up the capacitor, but discharging the capacitor. So we're going to, um, instead of building a circuit to charge up a capacitor by closing a switch, we're going to build a circuit to discharge a capacitor by, by closing a switch in a circuit. So that's this circuit here. The previous circuit, we had, um, we had a battery, a capacitor, and a resistor, and a switch. This circuit, we've got a um, capacitor, a resistor, and a switch, no battery. We had to have the battery when we were going to charge up the capacitor because we needed to um, have something to drive the charge onto the plates of the capacitor. So we needed the battery there. When you discharge a capacitor, you don't need something to um, pull the charge off the plates of the capacitor. The charge will naturally flow off the plates of the capacitor if you put, make a complete circuit. And so here, we don't need the battery for discharging. We did need the battery for charging. OK, so in this particular case, this, this is this is where we're starting with this circuit where I've got the resistor, I've got the capacitor, and I've got the switch. And I'm starting here not with an uncharged capacitor, but I'm starting with a fully charged capacitor. So in the prior example, the charging up, my, the capacitor on the plates initially, time zero, was zero. In this case, the charge on the plates initially, time zero, is Q. Plus Q on the top plate, in my example, minus Q on the bottom plate. We've got a charge capacitor. And if I leave this switch open, that charge just has to sit there. It's got nowhere to go. Can't go home. So it's just sitting there. But as soon as I close the switch, the charge can flow. Think of it just the positive charge leaving the top R plate of the circuit and flowing round to the bottom plate of the circuit such that the um, top plate becomes less and less positive, the bottom plate becomes less and less negative, and we discharge the capacitor, meaning we remove the charges from the plates of the capacitor. So that's what's going to happen with time. Again, in, this is just like the previous example. A lot of this example is like the previous example. We know where we're starting. We're starting with a fully charged capacitor. So we know this charge Q on the place of the capacitor. We know where we're going to end up with zero charge 
on the plates of the capacitor after some period of time, after some long period of time. We just don't know yet how we're going to get from the fully charged capacitor at time zero to the completely discharged capacitor at some much, much later time. How are we going to get from beginning to the end again is the question. And that's where these equations for charges and currents as functions of time involving exponential functions come in and tell us exactly how the discharging goes, like they told us exactly how the charging went. So let's take a look at that. So again, I'm going to show you two equations, one for the charge on the place of a capacitor as a function of time, and, um, and one for the current that's flowing as a function of time, just like the last case. I showed you two equations, Q as a function of time and I as a function of time. So here's the, the charge on the place of the capacitor as a function of time for discharging. Again, we've got Q, open parentheses, T, close parentheses, T, meaning this is an equation for the charge as a function of the time. And here is the explicit time dependence of the charge on the plates of the capacitor. If you look at this equation here, right, and think about it, at time zero, if you plug in zero for time, this is e to the minus zero, e to the minus zero, e to the zero, is one. And so at time zero, you start with the full charge Q on the plates of the capacitor. So that's where we're starting. If you plug in a time t, that's very large. Let's plug in the, you know, I don't know, the um, uh, time since the Big Bang, 13 billion years. You plug that in here, this is a huge, enormous negative exponent. That makes this exponential function zero. So e to the minus a big number is zero. And so there's no charge at large times. That's what I'm saying down here. But what this equation adds is how you get from that beginning of a fully charged capacitor with charge Q to a fully discharged capacitor with charge zero. It tells you how it evolves as a function of time. It tells you that the, the charge rolls off the capacitor with a exponential decay. So it falls like a radioactive source. The capacitor's charge decays away exponentially. And like a radioactive source has a time constant, a lifetime, the charge on the place of the capacitor has a time constant, a lifetime. And again, it's determined by RC, the product of the capacitance of the capacitor, the resistance of the resistor in your circuit that you're using to discharge the capacitor. So if RC is a big number, if this RC is a big number, because we're dividing by it, it's going to mean that it takes a long time to discharge the capacitor. If RC is a small number, because it's in the, new, in the denominator, if you put a small number in the denominator, small RC in the denominator, then the capacitor will discharge quickly. So again, RC determines the time scale for the discharge. All capacitors in these circuits will discharge exponentially, but they will have a rapid exponential discharge or a slow exponential discharge depending on the values of R and C. This is, again, each, each equation I show you, I'm um, also sketching it. So again, this is a sketch or a graph, horizontally time, vertically the charge on the place of the capacitor, so Q as a function of time. You see where we start with a fully charged capacitor with uppercase Q charge on the plates. We see where we end up over here on the bottom right with no charge on the place of the capacitor. And this curve represents this equation, which is the fall, exponential fall of the charge on the place of the capacitor as a function of time. And how quickly this fall occurs, whether it was quicker or slower, depends on this, this RC, this time constant here. That governs it all. What about, so one final equation to, you know, I, I'm giving you in total four equations, two for the charging, two for the discharging, a pair for currents and a pair for charges. Uh, the final equation here is the current in this circuit, around this circuit, as a function of time, after you close the switch. Again, it's I 
open parentheses, t, close parentheses, because I'm writing the equation for i as a function of time, and the explicit equation is over here on the right. And again, it's involving, involving the exponential function. And again, in this case, it says that the moment you shut the switch, that's when you get the biggest current. The moment you shut the switch, you get a current that's really um, just determined um, by, it's given by this little expression here. It's determined by the voltage across the capacitor's plates and the resistance of the resistor. So this voltage and this resistance determine this current, initial current flow. It also, this equation also tells you that if you wait a really long time, so we plug in a big time here, it becomes e to the minus a big negative number, that the current goes to zero after a long time. So this current will vanish, just like the charge on the plates will vanish. And it vanishes on the same time scale that the charge vanishes. It vanishes with this time constant RC. And so you see that in the equation too. Here's the graph. This is the final of the four graphs, right? For, um, for this time, the discharging, horizontal axis is time again. Vertical axis is now current in the circuit. At the moment you shut the switch, you get the maximum current. That current then falls to zero at large times. And that fall to zero is an exponential decay and the time constant, the steepness or the shallowness of that decay, is determined by RC. Big RC means a slow decay. Small RC would mean a big decay. OK, so just to sum, I'm going to show you a demonstration of this. But just to summarize, we've, because that was a, I felt there was a lot of talking on my part. Um, and I, I'm drained by it. Um, we charge and we discharge the capacitor. We've watched the charge appear on the capacitor as a function of time, and we've watched the charge on the capacitor disappear as a function of time when we charged it up. We've also watched the current that's flowing in the circuit as you charge it up and as you discharge it. We quantified the charging up, the discharging, the currents flowing onto the plates or off the plates with those four equations. So we introduced four equations. They all involve the exponential function. They all involve a time constant RC. And they're all about describing how the capacitor's charge is changing, changing versus time. OK, let me show you a demonstration. Um, here's a circuit in which I can charge a capacitor, so here's the capacitor, with a battery, and then discharge the capacitor through this light bulb, this resistor. And I can do that in this one circuit where this is called a three-way switch, two-way switch. Um, I can, here the switch is closed to the left, and so this would be the configuration for charging, because I've got the capacitor attached to the um, battery. If I flip the switch over towards the right, this would be the arrangement for, for discharging. And so it, with this circuit, I can charge up the capacitor with the switch on the left. I can discharge the capacitor with the switch on the right. And when I'm discharging, I'm going to see this this lamp light and the brightness of this lamp will reflect the current that's flowing while the capacitor is discharging. So that, that's what I'm going to do downstairs here with this, um, um, this magnificent demonstration. This is the capacitor, I know it's small. This is the capacitor on the bottom right. This is the battery on the bottom left. This is the bulb. Uh, on the top left, and this is the, that three-way switch. So these are, the, these are the four components in that circuit diagram. Um, they're just laid out in some other way. If I, it says charging here. It's 
and discharging here. This is because this, this is to tell me what to do. Um, if I close the, the three-way, two-way switch over here towards the, towards the left, I'm actually charging up the capacitor. Now, you can see nothing when I'm charging the capacitor. Look, it's just this circuit here. So charge is accumulating on the capacitor, but you've got no way of seeing anything. But if I charge it up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the mood. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discharge it now. And I'm discharging it through that, that lamp. And because of, you can see that I'm discharging now because you see the lamp lit. And I think you can see that lamp getting less and less bright as a function of time. It's getting less and less bright because the charge is rolling off, there's less and less current. We're literally seeing the time constant of this RC circuit. The time that it's taking for this lamp to go away is the time constant of the RC circuit. So it's some, I don't know, 10 seconds or 5 seconds or something like that. We're watching that capacitor's charge flow off its plates and neutralize itself. Anyway. I'll end there. We basically, in that last part of the class, introduced the charging and discharging of the capacitor. Uh, we introduced the equations, and we watched those equations with the demonstration. And also, in the first part of the class, remember, we did Kirchhoff's current voltage rules and how to apply those to circuits.